What's up, everyone? Happy Friday, and welcome to the game on Pax8 Live, the show where we talk about all of the cybersecurity shenanigans you need to be aware of. We're coming off of a, a week-long break, so we have plenty of shenanigans today. Uh, and then we're bringing on a really special guest later, so let's not waste time. But before we jump in, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, interact with us in the chat, and don't forget to sign up for Pax8 Beyond. Take my check now. Let's jump into the news. Wait, no, I want to address something first. Uh-oh. You you get a check? Like, I want to hear about this, Don. This is paid? a very interesting development. Like, you're actually getting paid for these things? Like, I want to do promos. <laughs> no, it's it's awesome seeing you, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm home for a little bit, which is oh. fantastic. I've got my studio shirt on, so it's just a good day. It's a good day. And uh, my Pac -Man we shirt have. On uh, today. Oh, that's fantastic. I know it's that a good one. one. Good old Hunter's shirt. All right. So uh, let's get into the news. I, I think we need to get right into it. So let's bring up this first article. MGM, you know, jokingly aside, one doesn't simply gamble on cybersecurity. <laughs> but I steal that from, from Jacob Horn. He posted that on LinkedIn and said, I'll just see myself out now, oh. uh, essentially, right? But, <laughs> but, but it's true. And how much did it cost him, right? Dom, you said something uh, in the pre-show. We are talking about this article. Just, what did you, just what did you before hear? we came on pre-live, I saw an article on my phone, and they're back, allegedly. Uh, and they're thinking it costs them around $80 million. They obviously haven't released yeah. such figures yet, but uh, $80 million or $8.4 million a day is what they were estimating. Yeah, and if you think about it, right, they were eight million a day. Forty-two million was the generated kind of number in that. They're saying, according to Jeffrey's analysis, and it's been a week, and I think we're getting closer to ten days. Promptly after detecting the issue, we began an investigation with assistance from leading external uh, cybersecurity experts. MGM said in a statement. Yeah, you know what's funny is MGM's statement comes. I don't know, four days, five <clears throat> days after the threat actors' written statement right. uh, that we got right. to read, which really broke down exactly kind of the nature of what was happening. This article goes on to say that the company reportedly pays tens of millions to do this. This is talking about Caesars, right? So we talk about this. We had it happen with MGM, but at the same time, Caesars Entertainment had the same exact thing happening, right? They they had a ransomware paid off, I believe. Right. Do we know attribution on that one, Dom? Do you remember on Caesars if they've given I the same attribution, attribution now, on that or one. if we don't have attribution? Yeah. So I didn't Maybe think I'd seen it. Doesn't mean I've it. not yeah. missed it. But we talk about this, and we get into, you know, the joke is that Jacob Horn made so poignantly <clears throat> is. You know, one doesn't simply gamble with cybersecurity, uh, right? And but that's the that's the not truth. And in fact, reality. You know, and I had an executive tell me this, and she was so right about this. She said, "Matt, as an executive, I am paid to take risks to make profit. That's what opportunity right. is." And so you get in this world where, in reality, that's not true. In fact, they're, they're, they're paid to take risks. And so you have to fight that very nature, which means you have to educate. You have to be able to tell what those risks are. And I would wager not to cast any stones because I want to make sure we're not, like, you know, victim shaming because it, it really sucks. And there's a lot of traumatized humans and there's a lot of people that really suffer from this. So I don't want to ever be seen as making light of this. But I do think that there's so trivialization of so many of the attacks we see in the news where this was done by social engineering attack against a help desk without enough factors of authentication, the ability to get through just one or two shields and have everything and everything. And then to be able to do that in a way that takes down the system so effectively that anyways, I don't want to get up on the pulpit on this one, but I kind of do. It's, I mean, uh, it, it's another it great was example. It's a big one. Like the slot machines weren't working, right? So there was some yeah. level of, of segmentation <laughs> that wasn't there, if you ask me, because that's yeah. like, how did the slot machines drop? And they were paying out, table winners in cash and like so the amount of logistical nightmare that this causes and then you figure how many people are mgm rewards members and are they at risk right yeah the little, the little and, thing and, you stick in the slot machine and that data has to be accurate in fact i know for a fact they make you validate your name and, and information on that with your driver's license for you to have that account ask me how i know right uh you might know <laughs> uh, so anyways let's kick on to the next one dom you want to kick this one off you, you're the one that brought it up it was a perfect you know, this, time dart this one is a little funny if you ask me so um if you don't know mgm is like the majority of the las vegas strip so if you stay at a hotel in the strip there's a good chance it's an mgm property so um the whole argument of picking another place is a tough one. Uh, but like the article says, in a particularly bad bout of luck for MGM, Lena <laughs> Khan, who is the chairwoman of the Federal Trade Commission, that's that agency yeah. that likes to go use the False, Claim Act, False Claims Act and go sue people. Yeah. Uh, They're was there among to the patients affected businesses by the do what they say they're going to do. <laughs> right? Uh, so along with 45 other guests, 
Uh, Con and her staff had to write their credit card information on a piece of paper when checking into <laughs> the hotel. I don't think PCI approves of that. An aide present for Con's interaction with the front desk employee said FTC chair has asked what MG Resorts is doing to protect the customer yeah. data. The de- and the desk agent shrugged. Uh, so there's probably oh, no. some some idea here about educating people how to deal with this. Um, but yeah, this one's oh, they bad. Do and say I actually... here it looks like they are attributing to scattered spider as well in this. There's some ambiguity oh, yeah. on that. But yeah, it does look like it. Um, but yeah, this is a tough one. And if we, if we think about, I actually put this on LinkedIn and kind of made a joke about it. Because I just, I mean, yeah. I don't want to be the dude saying, dear FTC chairwoman, write down your visa number. <laughs> but right, uh, right. the first comment was, well, we used to, we used to, uh, we used to imprint credit cards back in the day. And that's true, but we've evolved far beyond that. And in fact, all of the cards in my wallet do not have raised numbers. You cannot imprint them. And that's why they- Well, and actually an model. important point on this probably is that if I am hiring a third-party payment system to do my processing, I may not right. be subject to some of those PCI DSS requirements because I'm not doing those things. But when right. you're now taking and holding credit cards, you now need to have a process for this piece of paper and how I managed it. How does it get destroyed? How does it get used? What system does it go into? What are the security requirements right. of the system I'm inputting it from? Uh, is it done ex post facto? Was the actual person there to even sign the credit card slip? Do we? There's just so many of those things that come from not just PCI well, now DSS, that they're back. <clears throat> payment like industry now, and general standards. And now that they're back, if you really think of it, so some poor soul or group of poor souls has to go through however many slips of paper <laughs> Manually charging credit cards. So Nobody's how many gonna mistakes? Make a mistake. Us humans right, are exactly. perfect. Yeah, who's oh, going to get charged no an extra zero uh, yeah. when because they're just fat fingering oh. their way through this? It's not going to be good. Now I it's joke about this. Back. I have to now that we've called this into existence. I I was closing out a bar tab uh, that we were at for an awesome event. We were with <laughs> a bunch of different partners, and I I genuinely couldn't math. I, it wasn't from an impairment. I actually hadn't drank but one or two drinks, but I couldn't math the tip. And so, I mean, you think I'm not a stupid human, but I had struggles doing 1.2 right. times something, right? Like, I, I was, it was really a problem. I think you almost uh, tipped your 10 grand, didn't so you? I, think I did was, almost. That was tip almost an expensive thing. I gave one extra yeah. zero. It was ridiculous. <laughs> but the point is, or maybe two extra zeros in that. I don't even know. See, I can't even count zeros. But the point is, you have so many humans that, that would struggle and fail in that. And, and anyways... We got off on a dang right. tangent, but I sure wouldn't be staring. It, it almost sounds like a Saturday Night Live skit. You're like, hey, the right. one person that's the top regulator of us doing these things, can I ask you to break these things that I say I'm doing right. in my contracts? <laughs> it's almost yeah. a one-to-one direct so, proof. She has to be like, where are you, Ashton Kutcher? Where are you at? Yeah. Where's that camera? <laughs> like, you have to be. You're bunking me right now. Uh, maybe I'm showing my age. I digress. All right, let's move on to the last one. On a more serious note, Let's tackle this one real quick. Bring it up for us, Willis, if you will. Yeah, so War Crimes Tribunal, The Hague, <clears throat> says it's been hacked. The Hague, September 19th, International Criminal Court, or ICC, said on Tuesday its computer system had been hacked, a breach at one of the most high-profile international institutions, one that handles highly sensitive information about war crimes. Yeah, I think. Right? These are atrocities. Perhaps. These are the things that are the breadth of the worst of humanity being put on in a lot of these cases. The ICC said it had detected unusual activity on its computer network, the end of last week, prompting a response that was still ongoing, which is which is true, right? If you think incident response is a day, it's not how this works. It's not how any of this works. A spokesperson declined to comment on how serious the hack was. That's fair. They may not know yet and whether it's been fully resolved. May not know yet. And who may be behind it? They may know about some of those things, potentially. Immediate measures <clears throat> were adopted to respond to this cybersecurity incident and mitigate its impact. As he said, it's a short statement. It's permanent war crimes tribunal in the Dutch city of The Hague is established in 2002, which you have to understand a lot about their law, too, and some of this. But... In March, the court may, uh, made headlines when it issued arrest. We don't have to get into some of the, that part of it. Let's see what we got else here. It really is just basically, and we can get back to this and just talk about it, um, Dom, is really, you know, we start thinking about the sensitivity of data that we are responsible for as organizations. And when you're in the most sensitive of them, and they may be doing fine, let's not cast judgment that this is negative, but incident, right. if you're good at what you do, may be found very quickly and have no impact, Right. Um, and when right. you think about those kind of things, we don't have to get it um, too beat down the bush. On it. What are your thoughts on this in general? I think to to lay into the sensitivity, like the Hague is the modern, more permanent, established version of of the group of humans that did the Nuremberg trials after World War II. Right? These this is a significant. These aren't these aren't small time things that they're dealing with, um, right. and not so much in an effort to get political, but to share facts, they are the group that issued an arrest warrant for, for Putin in response to some of the stuff happening in Ukraine. 
right? They are dealing with, like you said, the worst of the worst uh, situations um, that impact literally the world. So it's, well, we don't know what's stolen. Unless, we don't know the impacts, but it could be pretty significant. Yeah. And if you think about why, and we, you know, there's a lot of these where I think this is a general legal aspect, not just this court, but all across the right. world. When you think about legal defense, I have to be able to say, here's a reason I feel like this might be in, not in my in my uh, defendant's favor. And it's right. in the U.S. We try to take this very seriously about how we treat that that rights of that human being. Right. It's, it's paramount right. to our, our entire Constitution. And so when you think about that, what if I can say to you, do you still trust this evidence? Is this still not compromised? How do I know that this threat right. actor didn't have some other ulterior motive or some other way that it damaged the evidence or damaged my client's ability to have a fair trial? What happens to the legal system as you see the very court that's part of this get hacked? And I don't want to postulate right. too much, and that's not my expertise, but I do believe that might be a future pin it for Brad Gross conversation maybe one day or other attorneys right. in that regard. But I do think that it's the simulation and thoughts of Sensitive data has to be protected with escalatory controls at the nature of its sensitivity. And I do not find much more than that level of sensitivity. So um, I hope this turns into be a really well caught incident with lots of principle of least privilege in place, a lot of segmentation and access, and a lot of things that help them detect this that are, that are compensatory to the level of what they hold from a risk perspective is. So anyways, get off my damn soapbox before I fall it and break It seems they neck. came out pretty damn quick uh, before sure. any threat actor could to report on it and be transparent. So huge yep. credit for that let's grab this last article a little bit of uh, hope and i think a little bit of honesty from the fbi here in this uh, last article fbi director urges private sector to in, uh, and to lend government more support in cyber intelligence fbi director chris ray said money the federal government is relying more than ever on private sector support uh maybe a little one-sided it's okay i still love them it seems to go in that uh consumption <laughs> hole but not back out necessarily except for maybe in some of the other forms like what we both participate in um, speaking at Mandiant's NYS conference in Washington, Ray said a packed room of analysts and cybersecurity professionals that it's become increasingly difficult to discern where cyber criminal activity ends and adversarial nation state activity begins. I, I don't think we actually have to beat too much more into this, but they say on further, criminals and hostile governments are already exploiting technology. China is poised to use the fruits of their widespread, speaking of AI, uh, hacking power with AI, even more powerful hacking efforts, he added. You know, one of the things that we talk about, again, and maybe we've touched too much on being super political or at least geopolitical in this in this conversation today, Dom, is, you know, when you look at a lot of the activities from certain nation states, they don't distinguish their business from their government. And I think that's what Ray's kind of right. saying here is that, you know, in some cases, cyber espionage, if we make a better spoon, there are certain nation states that would love our better spoon. And they don't care if right. how they get it because they don't see that as any different than traditional espionage. We tend to right. draw the line in the sand at, we look at government things and the touch on government technology, but uh, there's less of that delineation and separation there. But uh, I agree and with it's, him. It's complicated. There's a lot to that conversation because if you look at just a certain history of how other, other, and I won't name any countries, but how certain countries behave industrially, like some sure. of it is government sponsored corporate espionage in a weird yep. way. So Ray's right in, different in that. Flavors. How do you... Right. And how do you really draw the line between this was a, you know, like every country has some level of hacking groups that have nothing to do with the government that are doing very similar sure. activities to what the government's doing. It's got to be really difficult in that intelligence space to discern yep. what's what. Um, and, and our the, own the country included, Dom, really in right? Uh, you yeah, know, it don't we're not great at it either. Uh, Outward yeah, only. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. But uh, it's good stuff to see. And I do believe public private sectors uh, partnerships are going to be critical and tantamount to the success of this in, in general. CIS has been screaming it. FBI has been screaming right. it. And in fact, they have been for a long time. I, and as much as I poke the FBI, sorry, I love you all out there. They also have some good <laughs> things. You know, they've had a don't re-victimize the victim policy for uh, since the Obama administration. I mean, this, you're looking back a very long time to say, if I go in and call a report of ransomware, don't come and pop me for something else I was doing. You're here for the ransomware and to help me and be a victim. And so they've had a lot right. of those type of policies that make this very good. All right. Let's hear some brilliant words from Robin Harris. You guys have listened to me and Dom for long enough. And when we come back, we're going to have some awesome conversation with our special guests. Let's go. I want to talk a little bit about global risk. And I want to talk about it in the context of a global supply chain. And if you think about it, because of the way the world operates now, 
There's almost nothing you can buy that doesn't have something that's made from somewhere else. The way we're operating is that we're really connected. And so when we start looking at risk, we do have to consider what are the implications of doing business where we have a global supply chain. And think about COVID and the chips in the whole auto industry. It still hasn't recovered. That's crazy. It still hasn't recovered. And now with the whole AI and that chip and apparently our main manufacturer is in Taiwan and we don't want certain people to have access to that technology because they might exploit it for malevolent purposes. And so there's really a, some push when we look at our different standards and security standards, there's going to be more emphasis on evaluating risk related to supply chain because we really, really do have to be careful and cognizant that a disruption can occur that negatively impacts our business. When I first started Pax8 and we were doing our risk assessment and we were like, okay, warfare, nah, we don't have to worry about that so much. And, you know, certain natural disasters, we we're like, oh, we don't have to worry about this and this and this. Well, the way the world is right now, yeah, we kind of have to worry about all that stuff, right? We do have to consider, you know, if there's some political disruption or some natural disaster that interrupts the global supply chain or affects us negatively. And we used to kind of look at that and kind of like do a check the box kind of exercise. But now I'm going to suggest taking that to the next level because we're living in an age where things that we think could never happen, they happen. And I'll tell you, I'm going to date myself a little bit. Back in the age of the dinosaurs, when we were doing coding like COBOL, there were concerns about something similar. And, and one of the things, larger companies like the autos, they never would tie themselves to just one supplier. Because if that one supplier had a disruption, it could be a strike, it could be a natural disaster, it could be anything. And you were only operating with that one supplier, then your business was disrupted also. So that meant even if you didn't want to, you needed to diversify. You needed to split your inventory. Maybe this was your main supplier, but you also did business with this supplier. So we kind of need to start thinking about what is it we're going to do if something fails? Do we have a contingency? It's like right now when you're operating in the cloud, they've got lots of contingencies built into the very infrastructure. It'll fell over to another region, another facility, another zone or whatever. That's built in, but we have to start thinking about it more intentionally because we're taking so many pieces of our business and putting them into external hands through SaaS, through cloud, and through the global supply chain that we really need to think about what are the risks and what contingencies do we have in place if those risks come to be exploited. And that's not something, I mean, it, you know, in my era, nobody would have said, uh, what are the risks of a pandemic? That never would have been a conversation five years ago, right? But now we have to think about it. So I'm going to say when you're looking at doing your risk assessment and evaluating, even, I'm going to tell you something, even when you think about doing businesses with, um, you need to look at the financial viability of the businesses you use as part of your supply chain. Because if you use a business, what if you outsource something to a business and that business goes under? What is that going to do to you, especially if it's something critical? So the more critical the function, the more you need to think about, do I really want to outsource it to this or do I want to, you know, even if it ends up like maybe you have to pay more to go with a bigger, more secure player in the industry. These are all things we need to consider. And those kinds of considerations 
should come up when you are doing your risk assessment. Now you do your risk assessment at least, at least once a year, at least annually. But if there's a major change in the environment, you need to hit the pause button and go back and do a risk assessment on the pieces of your business that are impacted by that change. So that's my little two cents on um, global supply chain. That was awesome. As always, just fantastic words from from Robin. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm super, super excited. I want to do, take a second just because we're watching, we're streaming, streaming on LinkedIn. Uh, if you saw our test earlier, we were also streaming on LinkedIn. It was very uh, intense. the live test. one. Yeah, yeah, of course. We didn't make, make a mistake. Make sure it works. It live. Yeah. It doesn't happen. <laughs> we don't do that. Functionally test things. But uh, I want to say hey to Samuel uh, and Matt Mathias out there as well as few, a few others. Uh, Zach Littlefield, nice shirt, Matt. I am wearing my Pax 8 Studio shirt, and I'm very happy about it. So, yep, for sure. But what I'm really excited about is bringing on a dear friend of mine, someone that is trying to raise the tide in the channel for just as much passion, just as much capability as anything that you'd see out of anyone on LinkedIn or anywhere in our channel. So I want to bring in Juan Fernandez, because we're going to talk about some cool subject, and we're going to do a little behind the scenes of a Prezzo we did together. But Juan, introduce yourself for anybody that's been hiding under a rock, and Tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, Matt, I don't really know. Uh, there's, you know, I'm just kind of over here floating around right now, man. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, fair. Let's wrap it up. Over right here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I think for the big thing for me uh, over the years is, you know, I'm just all about giving back. You know, one of the big things I wish when I first started out was there was somebody there to help me out on my first journey through my managed services uh, career. And, you know, I just I felt like there was a gap in the in that space. And so as I have built my managed services practice, similar to you, we, we that's where we met was building our businesses and uh, yeah. just really been a champion of that, trying to help others and really trying to figure out meaningful ways to help people uh, grow their businesses, man. And so, you know, broke down a lot of ideas and ideals of how to scale my MSP that I took, you know, up upwards of uh, 20 million and. Uh, just wanted to be able to share that stuff back, man. So I do a lot of that now, done some channel chief work. A big thing for me is just being that channel champion, man, and just really helping the channel move forward. Yeah, and I, and I want to have some time to go through this presentation, but I want to take a second, you know, for people that don't know Juan and I and, and Dom, how, how Juan and I met, we were both presenting at a conference in, in uh, Puerto Rico. <laughs> And and I get on the stage and we had a pretty heavy argument. I think maybe Juan had a little more fire in his heart than I did at the time. And I did yeah. as well than I do now. And uh, and and I looked at him afterwards. I actually interrupted, as you said. How did you say it, Juan? What did yeah. I do? Yeah, so it was funny because, you know, we get off stage. I'm arguing the business side of it. You're arguing the tech side. I think we're saying the same thing. And I'm like, man, we're talking the same language. Violent you agreement. Remember, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in front of a bunch of people right and then we go out in the back and like we're at this event i'm talking to the ceo we're having a great conversation and matt walks over and pokes me in the chest and says i don't think i like you and walks off and i was like dude and me and the ceo of that company look at each other he's like i don't know what, what a strange like, what dude about? Like, <laughs> and he just, but we've he gone just off. And, and, well, and we've then, gone on though I, to be good friends and work on stage together, you know, quite a bit, right? We've, oh, we've done a bunch wow. and we're going to get to the end and you'll see something else we've done together here recently. But what, we, what we're here to do today is you and I, you know, and, and maybe we'll show the audience real quick how this came to be, right? So let's, let's kick to this production Producers, meeting we were in. And we're trying to figure out a show for the 22nd. And I brought up, brought up that you and I are presenting on the stage on the 19th. Oh, here he is. And I'll tell you, this is going to be funny. You can record this if you want to. Yeah. Hey, Juan, before you say anything, I want to remind you that I live or allegedly live in a single party recording state, not related to this conversation. <laughs> so what this is me calling Juan. I'll set the stage. We were in a production meeting. We had realized that I had failed to get us a guest for our show and what we were going to be doing for this week. And it was a little bit back, but I had an idea and I was like, Juan and I are doing a presentation. Maybe we'll just bring that to this show. And I call you, and do you remember what you said whenever I called you about this at all? You just started said, blasting oh, out laughing. Oh, I was like, they must not know you well enough, but I got your back, brother. 
he he almost like he knew I was recording him and hadn't talked to him, maybe because I set him up for it. But uh, but you know, one of the things I wanted to highlight, Juan, is you're always so willing to just say yes, and you're always so willing to just lean in and share what you have and what your expertise is. And I'm not here just to kiss your butt, but I really do genuinely appreciate that about people like you and me and Dom and what we do to try to give back and so many others. I don't want to take away from it, but sure. you know, that's almost kind of how this came to be, isn't it? Now tell me a little bit of how we got into doing this presentation that we did and, and, uh, and then we'll go into, into it. You know, and I, I appreciate that, Matt. There's a lot of wonderful people that are out there that have a similar vibe, right? You know, and I think that all of us really care. You know, I think that there's a there's a there's a big portion of the channel that actually cares. And, and I love being part of that group of folks that will take that call whenever somebody needs help that, you know, I don't know you, but I'm happy to help you because I really do care. I would love to see you be successful. And, and I think that that's where this conversation spawned from was what's not being said right now? You know, what are some of the challenges what was that? that we're getting? It's really like, what are we doing to help empower people be successful, man? Like, you know, that yeah. to me wasn't something that we talk enough about, right? And I, I talk a lot about that. And I, I realized that that was a big success in my business when I scaled it, was empowering others. And, you know, I, we see this huge shift. And so we, we started talking about what's not being said. And that's where this whole upskilling your staff came from. And not just the conversation, but like the tactics and like aligning it with cybersecurity and what the requirements are. Like, how do we actually truly help and empower our staff? So, and I'll be honest, Matt, it's been kind of fun, man. Like a lot of people come back and said, <laughs> I've never heard anything like this, even though you've heard the, how do I upskill my team? Yeah. Never in the way that I think that we did it. And I'm really excited about the fact that we did it the way we did, because it really made a lot of impact in a lot of those folks. And I've gotten a lot of messages on LinkedIn about it. So it's been, it's been cool. Sure. Dom, you know, let's tackle this challenge because the way we looked at it and you weren't part of this one, but we're bringing you in to co-present this with us. That's what we're setting the audience up for is Dom's going to be doing helping us out on stage here. We're doing it live. live. We're doing it live. <laughs> but the, the, the point is, what's the challenge right now? What do, what do we have from a skills gap perspective in MSPs? If you were just to close your eyes and imagine back from your days of running one and all the people you interact with, is there a technical skills gap and a skills gap understanding cybersecurity when it comes to the different various functions in MSPs? I had less of a technical challenge because everything we do in that space is so teachable, right? It's, it's, it's very teachable and you do it twice and you got it. From a cybersecurity perspective, I used to look at it in one lens, like the technical lens, right? Obviously, I don't anymore. But the technical piece of that, also very teachable, right? Yeah. I think the biggest gap is in understanding cybersecurity holistically and understanding how to implement and run cybersecurity programs, not just mm. shiny things. Yeah. Well, all right. We're done with our presentation. Dom just knocked it out. So we don't have any guys <laughs> to say. So Wrap it up. You can get 30 can minutes back. <laughs> like to be concise. Uh, you know. I love it. Yeah, I, I love don't. It. I like to be long winded. like a whole hour out of ours, Matt. Like, like Yeah. For Dom sure. We did. Like Dom just stuff. knocked her out, just dropped the mic and walked off. It's fair. It's okay. But let's get into it. I think that's the point is that if you're going to be successful, you hit the nail on the head, <clears throat> Dom, we have to be able to skill up people holistically. We have to deal with their own personal growth. You know, Juan, you, you touched on that. And that's why we're going to get into this is people just want to succeed, but they also want to know they have upward mobility, that they're going to be able to pay for something more next year yeah. than they have this year. Right. It's this want to succeed in life. And so we need to speak to that holistically when it comes to that. So, Let's go ahead and set the stage and, and we're going to go ahead and jump into uh, our presentation and we're going to bring up uh, myself and, and Dom and Juan to talk about it. Here we're introducing ourselves. This was at IT by Design. We did this uh, a little while ago and we thought it'd be fun to do this as about a bit of a behind the scenes and also a bit of a let's represent it. So we're talking about building security engineers and how to upskill your talent when you're building an MSP, right? That's what we started with. So let's go ahead and go on. Willis, and we'll go to the next slide and we'll jump in. But Juan, stop us when you want us to. Same thing with, uh, with Dom. Uh, and uh, we'll go from there. So what are the things we're trying to learn here, Juan? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously it's kind of, you know, it reads as it should. But, you know, there's, there's, three, there's three things you have to focus on. You know, you have to t ask yourself a couple questions, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, whether you know, when you're starting to look at cybersecurity as a whole and, you know, I'm all about asking the right questions that lead back to what I do, right? And I think that you have to start really assessing, you know, internally. When I start to think about cybersecurity and I think about what I need to be doing for my business, 
I talked about this and waiting a couple years to actually true up my entire organization before I started doing cybersecurity type tasks. And one of them, one of those key components was, do I have the right team for it? You know, I always focus on having certified individuals that work for me so that I knew exactly what to expect. But I think that even in the case the where the modern MSP is evolving, right? Like there's a needs gap to the point where Dom was yeah, saying, yeah. I need yeah. to train them up. So like, what are those pathways? Like understanding the need of the organization of the modern customer and like creating those pathways and then like really going through the process and understanding like the steps to success. Like I, I need to be able to see it. I talk about an employee success program and it was kind of a brutal moment, right? Cause I do this a lot where I, I you know, say, Hey, you know, during the pandemic, I asked a huge room of about 2000 people. How many of you here are having labor and talent shortage issues? And yeah, most of them raise their hands. How many sure. have attrition issues? Sure. They raise their hand. And I said, how many of you have employee success programs? No one raised their hand. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I said, one of the things they're saying is that I don't see myself being successful with you. Like, I don't think you're going to make it. So I'm going to go find a place that I feel <laughs> successful. Right. So like, yeah. how do I build that? Uh, where, you know, you're allowing your employees to feel like they're going to be successful with you. And not only do I feel that I can see it, like there's tactics behind it, like there's strategy for sure. my growth. And and I, I think that's where we, we were at here. And I, I it's really awesome to like take a look at this and go play by play. So this will be fun. <laughs> and I would just Let's I would do add it. context Let's... to that because you're hitting the nail on the head. If we think about managed services in general or the channel, sure. it's not known to be a great place to work for technical and it humans right in it's fact that's cadence. like been the, that's I been demand. the trend on reddit is like should i leave my msp right should i go back to corporate yeah. um and that's that's a real challenge so things like this can help reverse that and make the channel an attractive place to have an it career agreed you know it's interesting agreed. and i want to throw this in there because i saw this earlier today and it was an article by a magazine that many of us read and one of it was, you know, the top 25 jobs uh, the, and the companies that are hiring today. You know, what was interesting is that none of those jobs that were in there that they were hiring for were any jobs that we probably have listed as job description in our managed services stack. Mm -hmm. Like that is crazy to think, right? Like it's like, okay, cool. Well, like we live in this world right now. We're hiring for the wrong jobs and skills, right? So, right. Yeah. All right, we kick over this other slide. So we're presenting this one. And so the first thing we kick into, and if anybody's already caught the reference, <clears throat> maybe the Squirrely Dan was certainly the giveaway. I decided to name and ask all of our audience members to talk about some of the things that they think would be a gap in today's team, just without giving them sure. any precursor, right? So we're talking about help desk technician. You know, I asked the audience, I said, hey, what about a help desk technician? What are the kind of things where you would focus on security in their day-to-day -day lives that they're already doing? Dom. You're going to play the audience here. What about old Wayne, the help desk technician? What are some things that Wayne would have the first line of touch and the first opportunity for from a security perspective that we need to make sure they have skills for? Can I go back to MGM? Is that allowed? Can we? <laughs> it is perfectly allowed, Dom. This is so it's, it's, it's help desk is one of the weakest things happening in IT, period. Corporate, yeah. managed services, government, I don't care so many help desks and i would even argue the majority of help desks will help you if you call them and you tell them i'm matt lee and i feel so they stupid did it at DEF CON, i forgot Dom, my password they they... and my boss needs this report i'm gonna get in your account yeah. every time they demoed this they had a booth and a breakout session that was just se attacks where people were showing off yeah. their sales engineer or their their uh, social, social engineering engineer. skills yeah, not sales, maybe sales, both sides of the conversation, maybe. I suppose, that definition, <laughs> social engineering skills. All right. And so what was cool was, Don, Juan, we played this game, right? And we asked him each, can yeah. you uh, can you think of any others that came up? I thought the audience crushed it. Actually, they gave they gave not Dom's example, fair. actually, specifically in that one. But anything else that stands out on sysadmin tier two, we can kind of talk them through what we did in the, we don't have to beat it to death, but. Um, no, no, I, I think that that was the really, the, it's just understanding where you're at, right? Where's your starting point? Yeah. Put a pin in the map. Yeah. And then like, all right, let's let's do a string and let's draw where we're we going next and how do we get there? It was all beautiful right? minds by the time we got done with this slide, right? Like we had the, but the point was they kept bringing up things like, well, maybe Squirrely Dan, the project tech needs to have a baseline stig or a baseline that he's using yeah. to set up the new servers. And, you know, it's those kind of things where we take, and the idea of this slide was to get the audience thinking about how we already have these roles and it's everybody's job in security. And there was this one dude in the front that basically said, you know, Matt, this is all fine and well, but Daryl 
and can go and do the right solve and Squirrely Dan can do a project, but just Wayne and Katie go and break it because they don't understand the security of it. And they don't, yep. I'm like, everybody's doing security. I'm like, great, we're done. We just got to the end of this slide. You are correct. Right. I award you a million points. Let's go <laughs> next. And that was what I wanted people to feel out of that. Right. And, and I think we, we, we nailed that. So let's, Keep I'm going to call an acronym out, slide. though, because you missed it. Go ahead. STIG. Oh, Security my Technical acronyms. Implementation oh. Guide. Oh. Definitely didn't just Google I'm it. negative two points right now, Dom. You've got me up by one, I think. Uh. I hate you. Oh. All right, fine. <laughs> I don't care. It's cool. you got to call out your acronyms on the show, Juan. So this oh, next well, one, that's, Juan, see, why did you include this slide? What were you trying to get at, and what did we talk to the audience about during this, if you don't mind? Yeah, and I think that was just, again, back to that article that I was referencing earlier. Like, you know, one of the big things is like the skill set is changing so drastically. And I, I love the fact what you pointed out. I want you to speak to that and the instance sure. that you use that application security development. But one of the things was is like the soft skills. Obviously, we know that those are some of the things that are the, some of the you know the opportunities. But, you know, yep. really the, yeah. the hard skills, like they're changing so much and so fast. Right. So, like, again, those connective tissues, how are we actually mapping our current staff to their potential future needs? And really looking yeah. at, you know, yeah. what's you know benchmarking against the industry. And you you said this even uh, in the, in the uh, presentation, these are like enterprise type roles, right? But why don't you sure. give the example in your mind, of reading them. Security development? Yeah. And I went into that conversation of saying, raise your hand in this room if you've written a script. How many people do you think didn't have their hand raised, right, Dom? Like, yeah. so oh. when you think about it, what, we, what we wanted people, <laughs> right. Like none. Everybody raised their hand. And the point right. is, if you've written a script, if you're writing a company portal, a couple of people had their hands up for that. Right. And if you're doing those things and you're not focusing on having application security development, a CICD pipeline that makes sense, actually ways to show you're doing that due care and meeting your own control 16 on CIS, then you're not there. And so we were just talking about how the MSPs in general are doing the functions and things, but don't have kind of some of these skill sets. And there's not a one to one corollary for all of these being in the MSP skill set, but we use this slide to kind of say, this is where the industry is going in the enterprise and mid market space already. And you're either outsourcing some of these things or need to be thinking about how you upskill people in these things so they understand it, right? Right. That was essentially it, Juan. Well, and this is so much more because, Juan, you mentioned, you know, you're reading the top 25, 25 roles that are hiring, right? probably don't see a lot of sysadmin nowadays. You probably don't see a lot of help desk technician. One, because the titles have gotten a little fancier, like from a marketing parlance of like being a TSU <laughs> sure. technical support engineer. But when we think about like cloud security, right, versus other things we would have called a security practitioner before, or we see a lot of cloud administrator roles yep. come on in the enterprise that pay a whole lot more than a sysadmin role uh, in the managed services space. Uh, and honestly, don't demand vastly different uh, talent. Um, so yeah. it's really difficult at this phase to get our managed services roles to meet that challenge. I, will, I, will. I actually took a screenshot of one of them and I sent the job description to one of those companies. And I said, I bet you right now that your HR mailbox, this particular company's print of this job description has blown up HR's mailbox because they were like <clears throat> way up in the 200 range. And then all these other MSPs had all their other like job ranges down in the 30, 30, $40,000, $50,000 range. I'm like, sure. The, the job descriptions well, were almost keep relative, playing here. We, we get to that here in just a sec. Keep, like, going, keep talking, oh but play the, play the video for us. And I think that it was really fun. And as I sent it to him, I was like, <clears> he's like, <throat> dude, I've gotten over 200 applicants in less than six hours. And I'm like, yep. And that's because enterprise is paying relatively a lot more for that talent, right? So it's creating that competition yeah. and I love it, but we definitely got to and, start and, thinking about moving on. And keep us on track here. So we're going <clears> to <throat> make sure we don't waste all, you know, not get through our time on this. So I'm going to have Willis sure. just keep playing this and I'll ask you to stop Willis if I need you to. But that's what this slide was touching on is that the entry level roles that are being required in this uh, are, are there mid level. We talked about the pricing. And even when you got over to senior, 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 you can go ahead and pause it here. Um, even when we got over to senior, senior, senior at the bottom, we're still talking about numbers that MSPs have barely any technicians that are anywhere close to half some of those numbers, right? And so you get into this gap, to your point, where you could take a junior role and make more money than what the MSP side is paying. And so you have, we use that slide to kind of point out that the analysis on that. Now, this one you wanted to touch on very heavily, right, Juan? So go ahead and talk, to the, talk us through this one, and then we'll roll forward a little bit more. 
I will say, I mean, if you take a look, there was, this was one of the stats that I pulled from CompTIA that was pretty interesting to see because I track this trend, right? I'm always looking at where the puck is going and how well are we doing and how are we getting there? And one of the things was interesting was back in 2021, we were 28% behind. Well, in 2022, ironically, because we were 35% behind back in 2020, like we were way back. There was such a huge uh, labor shortage. Oh, we yeah. Were Dire, dire need and, and well and, capability and shortage yeah. even in the msp let alone right. labor shortage right it was, yeah. it was huge right like in the cyber ecosystem we're 35 percent behind like there was we were at a massive deficit so 2021 28 behind 14 percent behind in 2022 um that number is trending in the right direction but again i think you know and kudos to those msps that are out there there was many in the room that started thinking about how they're going to make and jump and bridge this gap and yep. you know the stats show the same 41 percent of MSPs are retraining their existing, no. retraining their existing workforce. That's pretty Tom, big. Let me ask you to speak to this. So what Juan's proposing here is we've gotten a growth of almost basically knocking it down to yet another one more iteration of that. And we're getting even closer, right? right from 28 to 14. Yeah. So if we got to seven or so, what are you seeing on the road, Dom, when we went to those boardrooms and we've been involved in several other conferences, are you seeing this kind of behavior that we're oh, getting man. better and more? So what was it? It was, it was, it was 2022 when we went to our first exchange security, right? I think that was the first exchange security period. It was in Reston. Um, sure. And, and we almost over-prepared for that one. There's a lot of smart people there, but they, they weren't thinking in this operational vein that you and I brought. Uh, and right. then we went to Dallas. Um, Maybe it was because it was hot. A year and later, was trying to stay in that room as long as possible. But man, like we were, we were really challenged that entire time, right? We had really yeah. engaged boardrooms asking really intelligent questions about what we were proposing. You could tell that their mind was churning. We undershot, I think, a little direction. bit of their capabilities, Probably. right? Like they, they were For sure, yeah. And it was like it was such a drastic difference of where the barometer was. In just that right. one year, and I, I think it's evidenced here by this one. So we said this uh, this slide. If you'll play it for us, Willis. Uh, by the by the way, Willis is our AI that's behind the scenes making stuff move. Um, it's, it's definitely <laughs> not a human behind the curtains. So Willis will play it for us. I wanted to tackle this one because one of the things that I say a lot, if we'll pause here, is that you can't separate cybersecurity from technology and IT, right? And it's this understanding that you you have all of these things that are that are part of that. And you go right back to the social engineering attack on the front end of an MGM. It, it, it's an IT function that is what destroyed the, the entire bounds of a security function. And if you go back a slide before that, <clears throat> and you're talking about how at this point, the I am as a word, right? Ide uh, identity and access management skill set that you saw on that slide three or four ago. That being missing, you know what we call that? Password management. Thank you. Yeah, I got my own. Dom got the point, though, because he pointed up. So I think in this case. No, I was just again, reminding was Willis to give you the point. We're ah, good. It's fair. It's fair. I did say it. But, you know, you saw it as identity and access management uh, skill set. There was a gap yeah. and that we're talking about. That used to be called password reset management. Right, that didn't used to be called identity right. access. We're not talking about <laughs> should you have access? Is this the right person? Are we validating process? And so we're talking about the same thing. And, and it's really why I also feel there's a convergence in the SMB around MSP, MSSP functions. Because you, you can undo all the beauty for that one gentleman in the very front, right, Juan? Uh, all their yeah. work by one you know, malicious or poor decision. Uh, potentially on the front end of that anything to just add to simple you, mistake right like just just yeah. missing a little detail or a little red flag and the whole thing comes down oh and that's yeah. where i think the beauty is right now right is as we see that bridge between the it and cybersecurity. you know i think best practice has always been a thing that we started off with and we kind of lost our way there because best practice wasn't always things people were willing to pay for <laughs> so we gave them a practice right and we gave them something that would work. And I, I think now we're coming back to the, you know, paying for that. And I think now it's just my, that moment where we're like, okay, we really got to get focused on this again. Well, and we got to do to this slide. This. Yeah. And, and to this slide, just speaking about, you know, your mission of empowering people and that general concept, sure. we see a lot of organizations where, I mean, how much does an L, L1, you know, new help desk person make, right? Sure. sure. Let's, let's call it 40, right? Uh, and they have to work alongside, you know, senior cyber analysts and senior cyber engineers. And what do they make? Right. Oh, yeah. If I'm the L1 help desk dude making 40, I don't care if I'm being honest. Right. If we think about empowering people and bringing these these circles here closer together where the 
the, the roles are a little more diverse in what I do for a living, I think that's hugely empowering for people. If I'm helping with sure. sysadmin tasks, but also driving the cybersecurity program, I'm worth more money as talent, and I also get to do different work. So there's a lot of opportunity to empower people as a part of this convergence, too. Yeah, 100%. Well, and, and then and we that, went on. That was really well. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, no. After you, sir. <laughs> One of the main things, and this was your slide. Stop it. We are you asked, this Yeah, your here's slide my, right this here. is my slide. I tease. Uh, I'll go ahead. So the last piece we gave, we went through is we showed the audience kind of something we had pulled from DOD Cyber Mill, um, talking about a quick checklist of asking what skills, what capabilities, what functions people did in their job and what they needed as a, as kind of a codified list, right? You look at the numbers we see here. Those are all parts of that list. You can find the link. Uh, we can post that in the chat later. But it was a link of all the skills you'd need for a help desk technician or for a support desk technician or whatever that role may be. And, and on the left side, if, if you'll zoom back in for me, Willis, on the left side, we see, you know, things that are very IT centric or ITSP focused. Think of like knowledge of measures of indicators of system performance and availability. Why? Because we're white glove. We're there to make sure that you have a great experience. We asked the audience that. And they said, yeah, what's my job as an MSP? To deliver a great user experience, to have be the white glove service, to be always up. And you'll see that on the left, that's what we've lived with, right? 113, knowledge of server and client operating systems. Check, need my people to have that. Skills in interfacing with customers. Yeah, we don't want to be that guy or gal, right? We want to make people feel happy, right. uh, you know, <laughs> and diagnosing con connectivity problems. But if you look on the right, uh, you start seeing how there's these functions that are much more basic towards security that might be skills gaps. And I think these are the ones we wanted to hone in on because we've been good about the left, right, Juan? But on the right, yeah. Dom, I don't know if you can make these out enough, but you know, let's speak towards some of the ones on the right if you can. Knowledge of cyber principles. I think uh, knowledge of cyber threats and vulnerabilities. I'm reading this blur thing as best I can. That's knowledge it. of you specific it, operational Winning. impacts uh, of cyber security I, lapses. Got like, I'm not going to get that last one. That's not going to too many lines. Okay. But that first one, <laughs> just the principles. Just if everyone who touches nerdy stuff in a company knew just the basics. Just, just the basics, right? Maybe, maybe the threat CIA response triad. circle. Maybe it's the CIA yeah, no. triad. Like, maybe if everyone went and got like the the ISC squared, and I forgot what it's called, but their new entry level. Like, make everyone or, or, send or everyone. Since we're to talking get that. about CompTIA, right? The sec. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Those things, yes, right? The sec. Yeah, no, 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 we're good. That's yeah. okay. We're gonna get there in a minute. I promise. We continue. Uh, that that would be huge if you if you could get everyone on the team, everyone on the team especially in an MSP, your accountants, your dispatchers, to understand the, the basic principles, I think you'd be so yeah. much further ahead than a lot of others. <clears throat> and Juan, I spoke towards 60, uh, 6900 yeah. over there, the knowledge of specific operational impacts of cybersecurity lapses, because I went on to say that one of the larger breaches, we can pause it right here real quick, one of the larger breaches I saw came from a technician that turned off MFA for troubleshooting and did not have an operational procedure to close that lapse back, right? And when you talk about those things, these are the type of things where, yes, we want to solve for this at a systemic level. We want to know with tech whether or not that has been left that way, right? There's tools that can tell you if MFA is off. But we'd rather solve it with humans not making those mistakes in the first place, right? Like teaching them right. and by educating their capabilities. So, Juan, this is all your slide. I'll let you speak towards it. Yeah, what no, are you trying I, to teach the audience? The same thing this, right? I'm going to say the same thing there that I said here. And it, Matt's always trying to get rid of the human element, right? He's like, hey, get him out of here. I don't want I still, him oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was one of the first, like, when we first met, that was one of the things I remember you saying. And I was like, well, uh, you know, uh, I still feel the similar way. And I, I think, you know, as I scale my business and I look at the modern and I look at a modern MSP and what they need, there's a thing we hear all the time and it's called people, process, and technology. And I, one of the things that I learned as scaling in my organization was that you sometimes make the inference that if I hire somebody, they're going to be able to know how to do something to your point, Tom. Like, but the problem is, is that if I don't have a standard operating procedure, I can't actually have someone effectively do what I need them to do and support my customers in yep. a meaningful way. So my, my argument on this was, is that I want to change it to process that enables people to be successful that operates the technology which creates the great culture which creates the great company right so like and that goes back to leadership and this is why we have to look at you know how are we aligning to standards as an organization like and this is where a lot of those msps that were in the audience i said look you're not doing it today just stop where you're at like you know before you yeah. start to step on this yeah. landmine know that there's one there and know how you're going to handle it when you do step on that thing. Because if you don't have an operational procedure for that, you can't expect your staff to actually 
deal with it when their foot's on it. And you're like, hey, and then they can't be sorry, successful, on it. right? You're probably going to yeah. get blown up, uh, and then they're right. going to leave your organization, right? So it's you just have to uh, think this thing through. And I think now is the time for us to do it, right? And that's where, to your point, aligning. This is where we started off was like the CIS controls. Like, how do I map people to the security controls. How do I map to yeah. NIST? How do I map individuals and tasks and job descriptions to all the things to create the the culture of security? And that's what this initially started off as, and and really trying to figure out how do we make this easy for MSPs to move forward on. So I love yeah. this. Uh, I, it was when you think about it in that lens, though. To your point, Dom. You know, I it, we get what we wanted, right? And that's why I used to hire only cyber, you know, secure, certified individuals. And if you weren't right. certified, I was putting you on a plan to get there. Like if I really liked you, you were going to get certified within like a very short period of time. Sure. Like 90 and days you did was... call that to action. I wasn't sure if it was in this slide, Juan, or the next one. Maybe if you'll hit it for me, Willis. I think it doesn't matter which slide we're looking at when we talk about this. We'll it see is. what we get next. It's this one. Uh, yeah, I think we talked about having things like I used to have a hacking club at my MSP. Right. The one yeah. that I was part of for many years. And, and you know, we had a hacking club where we would build those red team skills. And I made this this corollary analogy for the audience of you couldn't step out and be a defensive football coach. And I am speaking American football. Sorry, my audience, but that's what I'm doing. But you couldn't be an American football coach and coach defense without understanding how offense is played and, and what is a legal move and what can I do to run and what do people often do for tricks and what do we have to look for? You have to know those things. And so the advocation is find ways to empower people to grow the things that are interesting to them, that help them be a more well-rounded individual and add those things to that and, and encourage those certificates to be chased. One thing that we got feedback already on Juan from somebody was, and I think it was Henry Tim, who's actually in the audience. We saw him just a minute ago. What's up, Henry? In fact, we can all say it. Nice. You know, What's up, Henry? Uh -huh. Hello to Henry. But, but um, you know, as he was talking about, we need to spend more time on what I brought up, which was that Paul Jeremy chart. Right. And that you should yeah. be you said this one. I'm, I'm I paid for my people's certs. It was part of their their skilling program. Yeah. And you should definitely say, OK, what's the interest? What does a help desk fall in this Paul Jeremy chart? What's that bare minimum to Dom's point earlier? Is it is it CISA? Is it you know, uh, is it just going to be, you know, SEC plus? Are we going to step them up and ask them to have CISA plus or CFR right. or, you know, and depending on the role, it may be different. Maybe when you're dealing with first response, you know, like those guys and gals that take the phone call. Maybe you do do a CFR or a certified cyber forensics responder, right? Somebody that's going right. to do the right stuff to have that. I can't remember what the CFR stands for. So y'all can just take away one acronym <laughs> point for, for me. But oh, anyways, oh, there goes the point. I lost uh, a point. Like I gave away my own point, but I'm being honest <laughs> and I'm fair and balanced. You were there. You were there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, we were making that advocation. Anything to add to that that you were saying from, from there or, or Dom, if you want to kick in with anything you would add to how you would encourage people to gain that, uh, whatever your it's thoughts just in are general, that you're presenting it. Right? Like it's okay. Even if we take cyber out of this for a minute, like Pax8 is a sizable Microsoft partner, in case you didn't know. Sure. And we have all if you didn't these know, things. You're hiding to, under a rock. If you didn't know. Yeah. If you didn't know, we do Microsoft <laughs> stuff around here. Yeah. Light flex. And, Dom, uh, are you getting another check? Because I want part of it. If so. <laughs> that's, that's the second I'll have today. to call Lisa. But if we if we think about like just technical staff in general, I've got about 27 of them under me. Uh, and I need them all to be some level of certified, right? But what I found is, is I can say within these guardrails, right, which for us right now is Microsoft and will expand to other disciplines soon, what do you want to do, right? And the cool thing was, and again, I have 27, so that's a fair amount of people. It's, you know, your sure. industry might not have 27, but it just naturally spread out and we met our certification goals. And pretty much everyone, there was one, one, one dude on our team who, God bless him, got a cert he had no interest in it. He did it in like a week. But for the most part, everyone um, did a really great job nailing down a cert and they all got to get what they wanted. And, and we ended up getting what we needed in terms of meeting our requirements. Um, my point being is you should just have a conversation with them about what they want to learn, right? And there's probably a cert that lines up with it that lines up with your business's need. Sure. And I, I think, yeah, and a, I think to your point, real quick, you know, I, that's what we did. You know, when we we're growing and scaling our business. I was like, I asked the audience a question, how many of us came from the help desk or sat on the help desk and how yeah, many of right. us wish we were still <laughs> on the help desk? Like every no, hand none goes of us down. Bam. Yeah. Like, yeah. Nobody yeah. wants to be on the help desk. So like, I can't believe that anybody in my organization, like I'm going to get stabbed by a help desk guy or gal that loves the help desk for that. Like now that we put this on out on public <laughs> air, I'm going to have to step up my personal security stuff, man. But I will say, 
it was awesome because you can actually sit down with them and say, what do you really want to learn? And like, just set up that growth plan and be like, I need you to do it. And I want to do it too. Right. And we used to have competitions, cert competitions and like who got it done within like time, that. like, you know, and then have others help those that are coming in. So really great thing. And, and Matt, one of the big things is I, I truly believe about certification. Like that's probably been one of my biggest yeah. things in my entire career. And that, I know that, 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 a lot of MSPs have a challenge with, you know, sometimes affording those things. And that's why we did a thing. Well, and, you know, I'd like to shout out the Pax8 security team. One of the things that I love about them, they're doing a CTF for October, right? And so we're getting a little bit of Johnny foreshadowing here, but we're going to do a CTF and I've already gotten to watch some of them play it and go through it. I haven't been able to participate myself, but it, one of the things we talked about one was getting people to buy into doing things like try hack me and hack the box and participate in group CTFs sure. and understand things. Because like, if you look at a try hack me or hack the box platform, they're teaching way more than just tactical technical yeah. red skills. We also mentioned anti-siphon training, right? With Black Hills InfoSec and just basically making a call to action that these MSPs don't have to spend tons of money to do these skill set capabilities, right? I think TriHack me is what, 10 bucks a user a month and Black Hills InfoSec right. is pay what you can security training. Like, let's just be candid here. There isn't a lot of expense being involved directly except for the certs. Yeah. But if you skill them up and you go through that process and you, you make it a badge and you do HR things that show it, like something that you brought up when we were chatting was, Maybe your HR, when you do your job listing, doesn't say what you have to have as a cert rec. Maybe that's coming, but it says, here's the certs we're going to take you through. Talk about attracting sure. that eager talent that wants to do this, that understands the burden in front of them. And, you know, just basically asking the whole audience, and we'll wrap up with that and move on, but asking the whole audience to rethink how they're dealing with upskilling and not make it a tangential thing, but make it a very function of how they build people in their business. And it goes back to, and I'll close with this quote, and we'll move on to our book. But it goes back to this understanding that this question, the age old joke of what if I train them and they leave? What if you don't and they stay? Right. Yeah, it's this right. understanding of which would you rather have? Uh, and so yeah. that's the point we made. But we ended with this. Right. And, and, and Dom, thanks for playing along with us on this. And we're going to we're going to wrap up with the book and come back to you here in a second. But you and I did a thing, Juan, and, and we're going to kind of preface an episode that me and Dom and you are all going to do with with Marnie Stockman and with Wes Spencer yep. at some point, maybe. Yep. But let's let's talk about how we closed out this presentation, Juan. You go ahead and lead us in. Let's kick it on, uh, Willis, please. Yeah, you know, and I think that that's the thing, right, is we're looking at educating the, the modern ecosystem. We sat down and thought about what does the future look like? You know, we are always trying to yeah. figure out where the puck is going and, you know, what does this look like? But we can't, like, say where it's going to go, but how do we open everyone's eyes and give them some meaningful ways to do it? And you know, the QBR edition was the first version of, of, of this book. And I thought I was talking to Marnie and I said, you know what? I think it'd be really cool is if we got four perspectives on the next generation of managed services and let's have some fun with it. Right. Let's get sassy with this thing. And, you know, software as a software yeah. as a service and security. But why? Right. And really understanding. Yeah. And we brought you and Wes in and it was such an awesome opportunity to listen and, and watch you guys, you know, kind of uh, throw your ideas down and meld this book together. It's really fun, man. And cool, I'm really proud that you were a part of it. I mean, I was, you know, listen, I was honored when you asked me to do it. I think you tricked me into sitting down in the Fort Worth club with a bunch of recording yes, gear did. and a nice scotch. Yeah. And I sat down and recorded <laughs> with you for two and a half hours, the future of where yeah, we're going yeah. in this. And it was very centric on this statement that Dom and I very much hold very, very key to our heart, which is, if you look at the world tomorrow, if I start a company, there's zero chance I have a server, at least in most cases. Right. And I'm consuming some identity. And so we went through a couple of components. We went through the why, right? We're talking about that it's you know important for us to build confidence and push new ideas. You know, we talk about how change is painful and we don't think about it. And you know, you kind of wrote a lot of this opening section, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, you want to yeah, real hope, quick hope collaborate, it. and we'll move on to the next one. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing was you know, business operations as a service. And we talked about when we were back arguing on stage, those all those years ago, we were talking about business <laughs> operations as a service and automation and tools and cybersecurity, like way before it was really out there. And so yeah, I looked up this word and was like, oh good, we get to create a new word. But you know, it's so the why, like hope <laughs> is not a business model, right? Like I want to be a Matt Lee, sure. right? So I want to create my sure. own word. So business Hooked on operations hope. as a service. Hooked on hope. <laughs> but hope is not a business, like that's not a business plan. Right. And so how do I right. forecast the future and what do I'm looking at? And I really feel like, you know, cybersecurity incorporated with technology and what we do as a new managed era uh, is really what we're looking at. And you're truly operating a new 
like the new modern business. Like you are business operations yeah. as a service. Yeah. You are doing all the things for it. You're a trusted partner. You're no longer the trusted advisor. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm literally building your business for you on a technology front. And that's where I thought this was a really interesting point. And I really love that you and Wes brought so many unique perspectives to this because it really rounded the book out. Me and Marnie were absolutely uh Yeah, let's you know, go to that slide real quick. Kick guys. forward. Yep. We, yeah. we believe See, here this we go. Is our statement, right? <laughs> Education is the rising yeah. tide. We all believe that. Helping your clients get sassy will grow your business. I genuinely believe if I started a company tomorrow, I would be a very scriptable, malleable, repeatable, experiential based company that I could use tools and they just work. Think about the first time you used Angry Birds on your phone. How many times did it crash? How well do you need support right now for Angry Birds? Or does it just work? And you just fire it, just it up. Works. And so we're heading down that path. And that was the premise of this book. We brought four different perspectives in it. If you don't mind kicking one more for it, I think is the next one. Uh, we brought in these four. We came in with strategy coming in from Marnie, which, by the way, I'm so excited to get to have her on our show because she's probably one of the most brilliant humans. And she also knows how to she very did. nicely condescend to me into doing what I need to be doing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's brilliant. I don't know. She's a Matt Handler extraordinaire. And all of yeah, us, she, she wrangled did. us into making this book and she did it with so, such grace and, you know, asked questions she like, do you awesome. really want to do that? Is that the best decision, Matt? And it was just so guiding. It was brilliant. Uh, you know, we had me chiming in on security, right? Uh, you on business and Wes coming in from an yeah. insurance. Really, if we were to codify it, a risk perspective and, and sure. is really the way 100%. he focused on this from that perspective. So this is going to be great. I'm looking forward to having you all. But what's the best part about this, Juan? Why did we do this? What are we doing with the proceeds? Are we making fat bank and living on yeah. our tiny island? Now, the beauty of this book is it's a, you know, the whole model of the book is live, learn, give, right? We've all lived our lives. We have something to <laughs> We've learned and now we're giving back. And so the book itself is intended for the community to purchase, right? It's on it's on Amazon, but every dollar of that book is actually going into a fund. And that fund- and What's that fund for? Is giving, it's to give back certifications. So if anybody that buys the book that it goes back in, they can go to the msphandbook.com and they can click on give back and their staff can apply for certifications. We recently gave away $10,000, Matt, at ChannelCon for CompTIA so certifications. Cool. Oh, dude, that was like, that was so awesome. And so anybody that applies, we're, we're trying to meet the needs of everyone that applies. So the more books that get bought, the more certifications yeah. we can give away. And I want to say thanks to all the companies that have purchased books. Uh, they're just giving back to the community. Like and like 600 I really, per copies so far or something, which is it, like it's sold ridiculous. Quite a bit, man. Man. It's and the money's it's going back. A it's a give, time. give, right? It's really yeah, awesome. It's been awesome. Man. I'm just overjoyed so, with uh, the cause. I just want to say thank you for anybody that's watching. You know, buy a copy of the book. We're going to help give back and upskill, but also take advantage of it for your staff. That's one of the things Juan called out in our presentation was, you know, you don't have to go spend an arm and a leg. Even solopreneurs can go take advantage of some of these things and upskill their capabilities. That's literally what we want to do is rise tides. That's why we wrote this book. And, you know, Juan, I just want to say thank you for being here. I hope I can get all four of us in with Dom and have some good conversations about the book as we go forward. I'm really just trying to force Dom to read my book again so he can be, you know, part of the conversation. It can be, it it is, can be but, uh, totally up to speed. <laughs> But Dom, do you mind closing us out, brother? Juan, thank you for being here. I yeah. love you with all my heart. If you're not connected to him, thank connect with him on LinkedIn. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Juan. This has been a fantastic show as we anticipated it would be. But that is our show for the week. We're getting ready to roll into the weekend. I hope you're getting ready to roll into the weekend. Join us next week. We're going to have a couple of amazing guests, and we're going to be talking about well, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you find out next week. We're gonna be talking about regulation, yeah. some more regulation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we didn't wait. You didn't I, want I to think, scare him away, Dom. We need you to just thought it. if we said I, I think, regulation, I think we need leave to leave it. it for the presenters. You know, like it's okay. They're, they're okay. going to be better fair, at the fair. topic. They are um, awesome. Brother. But anyways, so they are amazing humans. Yeah. So we will see you next week. Don't forget to catch all the other Pax Eight live shows. Like, share, subscribe, all that jazz, and we'll see you later.